Hey, welcome back to the Backyard Professor Chess videos. We are to the point in Bobby Fischer's career. Now, we're still in 1956, but this is later on in the year. He's had a few years of work when he started to play these tournaments, and he is improving. He's constantly playing against the King's Indian attack when he's white, because that's what everybody played. And so... This is real interesting to see how they play this, how he plays the uh, the fianchetto, a typical opening, and how Fisher utilizes this opening to more or less just stymie his opponents. Very interesting how he works on bishop c5 so the development's coming he's got both bishops out here on the fourth rank crisscrossing right dead center through the center bold action i suppose he's going to bring up his knight properly knight to c6 is a great place for that knight now he does this a3 move he's going to keep he's going to keep attacks further away from his side on the queen side by this a3 move. It keeps the knight and bishop out of uh, this diagonal here that usually in the king's Indian attack, the queen side is fought for. True story. Because they're being kettling the bishops to go this direction, and his, his bishop is not being kettled, but he's heading toward the queen side. Although black has put both bishops out. So this is getting really kind of cool to see. Queen e1. Bishop bumps to g6, keeping that long angle toward the queen side here. Fisher, the, the central thrust in Fisher, we will see this throughout his career. Uh, if the one pawn bumps to the the three, the other one will go to the four, whether it's the D or the E pawn, Fisher is always fighting the center. There's a clue. That's our first pillar. Yeah, it makes perfect sense. And his opponents will fight him for the center, properly so. The knight takes the pawn in this instance from the D2 coming up. So there's good central argument going on steadily, non-stop, and the knight's exchange. The knight will take the knight, and then the pawn will take the knight. So he keeps a pawn maintained in the center. Both players are keeping a pawn maintained in the center. We've got a great open file here. The black queen is on that other end of it. So he's got to be careful. And he castles. At this point, it's looking pretty even as far as distribution of power. Bobby, More of Bobby's is over there. Um, the development is pretty even. They're just about fully developed. Bobby will bring his bishop up. Hitting that other bishop, definitely. True story, and queen e7 giving support for the bishop. Queen comes to c3, hitting the bishop twice. So the attack is on the bishop on the queen side, and now he'll exchange. The pressure got to the point to where it's okay to exchange instead of the pawn. Interesting. Now, if he had taken it with that pawn, yeah, he's got the double pawns, but look where they're located. They are hitting central squares. So, and it does open up the, uh, the file for the rook. Instead, Bobby took it with the queen. Yeah? And that's okay. Rook A to D8. Yeah, grab that file. Absolutely. Bobby's response early on. Something we've seen numerous times. You don't have to let your opponent have that file. Not at all. Rook A to D1. Rook will take D1. Fundamentally so. 
Rook will take d1. Yes and yes. And now Rook will go to d8. And now Rook will take d8. It is better since there is only one open file and since usually as a general idea they whoever controls the file will have the attack doesn't necessarily guarantee a win but it gives you the oomph of the attack it, we will see this theme in Grandmaster Games numerous times it's something we want to in our own games get used to because you're better off without the rooks than you are letting your opponent have the open file. I'm not quite sure if you're aware of that or not, but you need to be. Sincerely, if the position allows you, if you have been developed, which they both are, and the position allows you to completely play without the rooks, you're better off doing it that way. So we need to learn to play without our rooks. Again, this brings out the idea that we have to know how to play our minor pieces. Interestingly, at this point, the draw was offered and it was accepted. So this game was a draw. Uh, we don't know why. Uh, I mean, technically, yeah, the, no one has a majority of pawns on either side. It's the same amount of material exactly. And after the queen takes, they have the same material. It, a queen or the knight, it, my suspicion is that I don't think that would be the right way to exchange it would be with the queen. At this point, the game is really honest to goodness even. And so I suspect that's why they had a draw. So let me show you the next game in the tournament schedule of Bobby Fischer. And we'll see him play a really good game against Lapican. Again, the King's Indian Attack. This is 1956. I'll bring that game right up. Okay, this, this game with Lapican, Fischer is white again. King's Indian Attack again. We're going to get used to this opening, which is wonderful, because we get to study how one of the greatest of the Grandmasters played this opening so well. It's really cool to see. D5. Now that's a strong forward thrust in the center right now. Lapican's not messing around, and he puts the Bishop to F5. And Fisher will castle. You always castle early in the King's Indian attack. You just you put the knight out, bump the fianchetto, get the bishop out, and castle. That's the essential feature for white. Instantly. Get it done. And then e6, supporting that central pawn, of course. The d3 will support an e4 push later on when it's feasible. Right? You don't want to push it immediately. Sometimes some do. But Fisher holds out and develops his knight first giving support to the square so that he could put, he may even put the rook here and then push the e4. But ultimately, Fisher will want to argue for the center with his pawns. In the King's Indian attack, this is what you do. He's developing pieces to support his pawns in the center. This is the idea, right? And now knight a6, kind of a different knight move there. A3, again, that's a, that's a typical standard, keeping this bishop from coming to here, keeping the knight from coming to here. It kind of, it doesn't refute, but it puts a damper, as it were, on the progress of a queenside attack or a queenside advance, if that's how black wants to play this. And, look at this, uh... Where am I here? A3, and now knight c5. So the knight comes in, the knight's becoming activated, and he's coming toward the center or back down toward the queen side. So this will be a tough fight, and now Fisher pushes the c4. 
He hasn't done the E4 yet. I suspect he will, but he is advancing because of this small bump with the pawn at d3. He can advance either the C or the E or both and fight the center pawns. This is a good central fight that's going on. And now he bumps the b5, so the fight is on. And Fisher puts his knight on d4, an excellent central post for the knight. Not an outpost, just a good square at this point. Queen to d7, he's going to get ready to castle queenside, it looks like. At least he's got that option. Kind of interesting. Bishop will exchange the bishop. He takes that bishop. The bishop has a great diagonal going along here. He takes the bishop out. E takes F, opening up the king file, a partial file, at least getting rid of the black pawn for the black side. The center is still very much... The E4 square is black. You can see that. I mean, the two pawns and both knights are hitting e4. That is the most important square in this game. You can see that. Fisher is contesting it. So there's our square. This is what we're looking at in this particular King's Indian battle. Yeah? Knight comes to b3 now. He's going... This knight is supporting that square. Fisher's knight is supporting that square by wanting to swap knights or get black to move his knight. There is less argument for that square. Notice Fisher has one, two, three pieces hitting that square, but his opponent has four. So Fisher's going to try to whittle him down, it appears at this point with that knight move. And you're saying, well, he's not fully developed. How come he's moving pieces around? Again, the development is a temporary imbalance. And in order to fight for such an important square, Fisher apparently feels justified in moving that twice. We'll see what happens. Let's see what happens. H6. He's stopping the bishop from coming here, hitting this knight that is supporting this square. So he is, by this move, he is indirectly supporting the e4. That's why that pawn move makes sense. That's interesting to see that. Isn't it? I mean, this pawn is as far away from e4 as it can be on the physical chessboard. And yet that move helps support <laughs> the e4. Isn't that interesting how that works? Chess is all interconnected, interrelated. So this is getting really interesting. Bishop e3. Now, this is a young Bobby Fischer. Yes, as a general rule, you don't want to blockade one of your own pawns on its home square in the center, no less, with a piece. And yet his choice makes sense. See, there's, there's an exception to every rule in chess, no joke. Because he's hitting the knight. That is, he can't hit this one. So he says, okay, I'm going to hit this one twice. Yes, it's guarded. However, a double attack, now something has to start giving because both of the pawns here are already past supporting that knight. The knight is on a weak square, and there's a weak pawn right there. Yeah. Yeah. Very interesting how Fisher decided, yes, I know I'm in front of one of my pawns that haven't been pushed, and it's a central pawn. It's got to be pushed. But for right now, it's better at this point to get rid of that knight. He's eliminating the strength of the support for the e4 as best as he can. That's what's going on. Very interesting to see this, yes? It works. 
rather than exchange, he drops the bishop, uh, the bishop, he drops the knight back. So Fisher's strategy to eliminate one of the defenders of e4 has now worked. Now what do you do? He puts his knight on d4. It looks like Fisher wants to exchange the knight pair. Or, or I should say eliminate the black's knight pair. Fisher has the bishop pair. He doesn't want his opponent to have the knight pair. I mean, that's what it appears that he's doing because he's making an awful lot of knight moves, isn't he? Now, the center isn't blown wide open. There really is no basis of attack anywhere at this point. So it's a maneuvering, a manipulation to see who gets the stronger minor pieces. Notice this uh, Silman theme, Jeremy Silman theme, of the critical importance of the minor battle. The battle between the knights and the bishops in a chess game, this is a real good illustration. Fisher is just relentlessly trying to make his minor pieces first better than his opponents. This is the first order of business, apparently, in Fisher's mind. Fun to see, isn't it? You're kind of real interested. So it makes sense. You're saying, well, I, I used to harp a lot. I used to say, man, do not move pieces more than once in the opening if you can at all help it. And here we see Fisher moving that knight all over the place. But watch the effect. That is what is instructive here. This is so interesting. Knight to d4, and now he goes to g6, and there is a question mark here. There's no comment, but there's a question mark. Oh, oh, actually, I lied. This is too slow. He said he's too slow because the nature of Fisher's bishops pawn pushing now is too slow. He must finish his development. Now, that's fascinating, isn't it? Because Fisher hasn't finished his development yet either. But it's the, it's the position of his bishops that is making it critical that he can't waste time anymore on pawn moves. Now you've got to go to pieces. And how so? Queen b3. Now Fisher's development is taking on a power aspect. He's on the queen side. There is tension here, and Fisher put his strongest piece on the queen side now. And he is hotly contesting the center. How does this work out? Rook b8. So the development is just about there, and now knight takes the weak backward pawn. And you ask, Okay, he could have exchanged a piece for a piece, but he took a pawn, and he's going to lose a piece for a pawn. Not only that, he took the pawn with a knight that has already moved four different times. That's right. The weakness is what Fisher was attacking, not necessarily the material. Yeah, he could have had a knight. It's stronger to conquer the weakness in the position. Let's see how this unfolds. Queen will take, of course. That's the only piece guarding that pawn. And now C will take D5, hitting the queen, Knight will come to c5, hitting Fisher's queen. Notice they're looking for targets as they're attempting to strengthen their position. That's one of our pillars. Truly, yes, we're seeing it happen here. Live on Backyard Professor TV! 
<laughs> yeah, I'm kidding. I don't have my own TV station. Thank goodness I hear it costs a lot of money to run those. Whew. So Fisher has to come to C3. He does not want to swap the queens. He wants to keep the ladies on the board. And so he saves his queen also. Centralized. Central influence. Centralized. Strong pawn here supported, even though it's hit and hit, as far as that goes. Make an interesting knight fork with the, the uh, bishop and queen, wouldn't it? Bishop will take the knight. Now, Fisher has the bishop pair, and yet he's using them very effectively. However, the queen does take the bishop. She is supported by the, by the bishop. So the queen takes, and now the queen, rather than exchanging queens, takes f6. And it is here that black resigned. Fascinating, isn't it? Observe something interesting. Where is all the influence of that e4 square of black's? There's only one pawn supporting it now. Who has influenced that square? Now, mind you, he didn't even use the square. But he fought for it. He, he challenged a weakness and went after the weakness. And because of that, the position of black ended up being too weak and he he resigned and here's what here's what I found if rook does go to g8 then queen will come to e5 check and nab the rook so fisher gets an entire rook and that is the effect of rather than exchanging a piece for a piece material wise that's the effect a fisher going after the weakness. That is a remarkable little lesson. It's a great Bobby Fisher win. So these games, they're getting better. You can begin to see the subtle Fisher energy in this youthful chess player beginning to expand and grow, can't you? There was some really interesting sophistication in this game of a 13-year-old Bobby Fischer, wasn't there? And that is so cool to see. So that's two games in one video. That'll work for this video for now. I will continue on with my Bobby Fischer series of tournament games, and I will intersperse it with other materials as well that I am getting both out of my own fan club on Lychus and in other Grandmaster games that have themes similar to what Bobby Fischer is doing. So there's a lot of exciting chess coming up in future videos, so stick around. In the meantime, remember, get plenty of sleep, drink lots of water. I'm drinking lots of water. Yes, you have to pee every hour on the hour. That means you're drinking enough water. Truly, that's what the doctor says. I'm not joking. Every hour. And get lots of sleep, eight hours. That way your brain can regenerate as well and keep studying tactics and, ooh, hey, tactics. Now, unfortunately, I'm afraid I'm going to jinx myself here. I hope I don't, but the unrighteous, they have a tactics area where you get to study tactics. And I mean, you can study hundreds of them every day, truly, for free, you guys. It's unrighteous. My tactics, when I first got on, I got up to 1800 just briefly and then just fell off the cliff. <laughs> I was not aware of the astonishing variety of tactics that can be had in chess games. Truly. I mean, I plummeted down to 1306, I think, in my rating. And through this month, 
I have been working on my tactics, just steady, a little here, a little there, a little here, a little there. I have gone from 1,300. Today, I am at 1,806 in my chest tactics rating on Leiches. It pays to study. This stuff is working. Unfortunately, it works pretty slow. And now that I've said I'm up to 1,800, watch. It's going to start throwing so many more hard tactics at me that it knocks me all the way back down to 1,500. I've been knocked down, and then I build myself back up. Then I get knocked down and build myself back up. Juzernim, a very good online friend of mine in our fan club, and he is a visitor of these uh, videos as well. He told me that some of his tactics, it takes him two hours to study them through. He'll do four or five tactics a day, and if he misses just three of them, he loses 200 rating points. He's up to like 2,400 in his tactics right now. <laughs> He's an awesome chess player. He just blasts me every game we play. Great guy to play and learn from, though. So, anyway, thanks for watching my Backyard Professor Chess videos. Stay tuned. There's a lot more coming down the pipeline in all kinds of different ideas. So, in the meantime, I will see you in the next Backyard Professor Chess video.